Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's SNM webinar. I'm Bodhle Kagalashe. I'm one of the researchers in the pyrometallurgy division at Intech, and I'll be chairing this webinar. Thanks to all the attendees from all over the world for joining in today. The speaker for this session is Dr. Johann Zitzmann. He has a PhD in metallurgical engineering from the University of Pretoria and has published uh, several papers at peer reviewed conferences and referred journals. He has more than 25 years of extractive metallurgy experience, both in industry and academia, as well as software engineering related to extractive metallurgy. He is the founder and the CEO of Exmente Technologies, a pyrometallurgy consulting and systems development company. In line with his research and development interests, he has an honorary appointment at the University of Pretoria as the Glencore Chair in Pyrometallurgical Model, where he guides masters and PhD students. His interests in extractive metallurgy include pyrometallurgical and hydrometallurgical processes, thermochemistry, computational modeling, slag freeze linings, and new process technology development. In software engineering, he is involved in design and development of information systems and software for process modeling, financial modeling, operational enhancement, and advanced process control. Today's talk, ladies and gentlemen, is entitled Modeling of Slag Freeze Linings to Support Furnace Design and Operation. As we all know, containment of high temperature processes is a challenge faced by all pyrometallurgists. One method of protecting furnace reflectors is to maintain a freeze lining of solidified slag between the hot slag bath and the refractory walls. When designing for and operating with slag freeze linings, it is helpful to have, to have tools to assess the influence of different design, a startup and operational parameters on safe containment, tapping, process stability, and process monitoring and control. Uh, this webinar will present different types of modeling uh, that can be used to address different questions ranging from thermochemical calculations and 1D heat transfer models to process and multi-physics models of the furnace. Looking forward to an engaging discussion after the talk. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, kindly note that this webinar will be recorded and please ask your questions under the Q&A tab at the bottom. There will also be a possibility for you to raise your hand and ask your question live. Uh, and this will be addressed at the end of the presentation. And over to you, Dr. Zitzman. Looking forward to an inspiring presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, just please confirm that you can uh, hear me clearly and that you can see my screen. Yes, I can hear you clearly, Dr. Zitzman, and I can see your screen. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the, for the introduction, Bruce and uh, thank you to the SIIMM for this wonderful platform to engage with our community. Um, okay, so the topic of the talk is the modeling of slag freeze linings. It's something that I've been involved with uh, for quite some time. And the focus currently of why we are doing this in Xmente is really to support our clients and, uh, and collaborators to, to be more successful through uh, improved furnace design and operation. So although modeling might seem theoretical and academic, um, the, the, the aim of what we do is very much practical and having a, a positive influence in industry. Okay, so let's get started. I will first just give some context uh, because freeze linings are quite general and I'll frame the talk within a specific context. Then I'll briefly introduce what freeze linings are and then uh, move my attention to models. Uh, what are models and, and why do we use them? And then I'll step through the different types of models. First of all, material behavior or material properties, 1D heat transfer models, process models and multi-physics models. And then we'll just wrap up by looking at where we are at the moment and what, where are we moving into the future? What are the things that might, will become possible in the future? 
Okay, so as background, the, the context of freeze linings, they are, are widely applicable. There are several processes, high temperature processes within which slag freeze linings are of great importance. Um, and we do believe that the, the importance of slag freeze lines will, will increase in the future, especially when we consider um, re recycling of, for example, electronic scrap, which uh, uh, confronts us with much more complex um, materials. So this little thing called the slag freeze lining is, I think, not only of academic interest, it is also quite important when we move into towards uh, closer to a uh, circular economy. So in my talk today, I will specifically focus on DC and AC open bath electric furnaces, uh, where you've got an open slag bath, as, as uh, you can see in the diagram here. And the commodities that we are currently uh, very much engaged with are ilmenite smelting, chromite smelting, and the smelting of uh, PGM concentrates. So for the moment, I will ignore other reactors like submerged arc furnaces, TS and TSLs, and processes and commodities like iron making and steel making. Although within the next year or two, we will be engaging uh, with such processes as well, where, where freeze linings are important. Okay, so what are slag freeze linings? Um, like Boutle said, Process containment uh, is a challenge in, in, in pyrometallurgy. And the one option to contain the slag bath successfully is to make sure that your, um, your slag is saturated in the uh, major components of the refractory line. Then the slag would not have any thermodynamic driving force to dissolve the refractory lining, and the refractory lining will remain largely intact. Now uh, that's not always possible. So, and if, if it's not possible, uh, an alternative is to establish a slag freeze line. And if we consider a cross section of the of a DC furnace and the wall region, then we can see we've got the refractory uh, side wall, which we want to protect. We've got uh, a, a molten slag path, and then we've got this layer of protected process material, predominantly slag, that solidifies on, on, this, on the cycle. And that little thing, that little brown thing, is what we call a, a slag freeze line. Now, why is this important? Now, it's not always possible to get slag refractory compatibility. Sometimes the slag is just incompatible with uh, your refractory lining. And if the, the molten slag gets into contact with the refractory lining, it will start to wash it away. Uh, this, a, a good example of this is the process on which I cut my teeth as a young engineer is ilmenite smelting. Now in ilmenite smelting, the, the slag, when you, you, you bring molten slag into contact with the lining, it destroys the lining. But we cannot flux the slag in that case, to make it compatible with the cycle. Uh, because the slag, the high titanium slag is the main product and there's, there are uh, very stringent specifications on the MGO uh, content of the slag. Um, so saturation in that case is not a process containment option um, because we cannot achieve saturation. Uh, another factor is that um, if, if we take this phase diagram and this little red dot is an unfluxed slag composition of a, 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 a chromite from Kazakhstan, if we were to flux this slag so that it becomes compatible with an alumina lining, which some of the, the open bath furnaces do employ, then we would have to um, feed an enormous amount of alumina to draw the, the composition of the slag towards this AL203 or the corundum region. Only when it reaches this uh, uh, phase boundary will it become saturated. Um, and if we were to do something like this, for this example, we, we would probably spend so much money on, on a bauxite, something like bauxite and energy to, to, to melt it, 
that it would be uh, economically infeasible. Now, like I said before, when we consider recycling of, for example, electronic scrap, we have very complex, uh, complex materials that we now have to smelt. And those slags that we, that we foresee we, should, we would be using would often be incompatible with the lime. Um, and then uh, slag freeze linings will again be, be important. Okay, so that's slag freeze linings. Now let's have a look at, at models. Now I've been modeling since uh, as I started my engineering studies, different types of little computer programs, uh, because that's uh, what I loved to do from a very early age. But the, the need for models is really triggered by the need for better furnaces. If we go into the future as a biometallurgical industry, I, I do believe we, we need to be doing things a little bit better than what we are currently doing. So the furnaces need to be more resilient. So we have to be, uh, we know that we will be able to reliably start up a furnace and they should be easy to operate. Now, some furnaces are really, really difficult to operate, but uh, we do believe we've seen in Exmente that you can design the process in such a way that it becomes more robust. Now, that is not as a rule being, being done at the moment. Also, uh, it needs to be easier to control. That's also the, the process dynamics of a process you can decide on ahead of time so that it becomes easier to control. And of course, we also want the, the furnaces to last longer. They also need to be efficient. Um, I mean, the environmental impact of our industry is, is severe and we, we uh, would have to uh, get to a position of lower heat losses from the furnaces, lower material losses. And if we are recovering something like precious metals or, uh, or base metals or PGMs, we, we, we want even higher recoveries than what we're currently getting. And then the lining has to last longer, um, locally and the lining as a whole. Uh, stoppages like tapo repairs are, are also um, a, a point of failure that we want to improve on. Now, in, in short, what, we, what do we want to achieve? We want more sustainable high temperature processes. And if we are moving towards this, then modeling can help. You can do experiments in the lab, you can do experiments on pilot plants, you can uh, do even measurements on industrial scale, but all of that data combined with modeling can be a potent combination. Now, what do we need these models to do for us? Now, uh, when we design new processes uh, or develop new process technologies, or when we assess uh, the, the performance of, of an existing operation, uh, we have to uh, be able to assess, or it would be good if we are able to assess the influence of design decisions, startup plans or startup philosophies, operating philosophies on things like, are we going to be able to safely contain? Will we be able to tap reliably? Is the process going to be stable? Will we be able to monitor the process, that the important process parameters and control them? And what is the efficiency going to look like? So if models can help us with all of these things, then of course we, we would gain a lot of advantage from it. Now design decisions and design parameters are typically things like material properties, which we don't really have a say in. Uh, the raw materials are in general what the raw materials are and the process materials are derived from that. Uh, furnace geometry, uh, the refractory lining, um, the, the decisions that we make there and the cooling system design. Do we need copper cooling or can we uh, uh, have more passive cooling? Then also, uh, depending on how you want to start up the furnace, if you want to start up uh, one method versus the other, what will the influence of that be? Uh, for, uh, filling up your furnace, how are you going to do that and what will the influence of that be on, on, the, on the life of the lining, for example? Uh, low power levels. Uh, let's say you have an 80 megawatts furnace and you operate it for a dura some duration at 30 megawatts. What are the influences going to be? Are you going to survive uh, long enough during the low power levels to be able to get to 80 megawatts, for example? Uh, operation, 
uh, what is the in, uh, influence on varying throughput or electrical resistance, raw material variability, disturbances like shutting down the furnace and bringing it back online or set point changes? And what are the influence on of different process conditions like different slag bath and alloy bath temperatures? So these are all the things that go into a process or a design or a process technology. And they all can, to some degree, influence, for example, the freeze lining. Will we have, given uh, some concept that we have devised, will we be able to sustain the safe slag freeze lining? And what is the lining wear likely to be? Um, tapping is, are we going to have difficult tapping? Or can we make our lives a little bit easier by making certain design decisions? What are the runout risks and, and how often will we, we have to replace that box? Um, on stability, what will the bath temperature variability and the bath composition variability be? Um, the, the monitoring and control, how, if we have a slag freeze lining, how will we monitor the state of the freeze lining, whether it's intact or not? Can we use wall thermocouples? That's a tricky situation because wall thermocouples are really slow. Um, how can we detect lining loss and, and how can we assess uh, the, the, the process dynamics? So what's the influence of the process dynamics? Um, efficiency, heat losses, material losses and recovery. So this is the kind of the use cases for different types of models. If we uh, study processes with slag freeze linings, this is a, 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 a list of things that we might want to to consider asking questions on and doing calculations on. And you, for many of these things, you can do laboratory experiments and, and pilot scale work, which are extremely valuable. But of course, that is very slow and, 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 and expensive and modeling can help us with this. Okay, so the first class of models that we look at, and, and it's almost not models. I don't think we always see them as models, but it is when we describe the behavior of materials. And in Xmeta, we use software like FactSage and ChemAppy um, and our new XMeta thermo package uh, to, to do large scale thermochemical evaluations for our clients. And then we look at, for example, the behavior of an ilmenite smelting slag, uh, the different phases that form as a function of temperature. Uh, we have a, a liquid slag and when the slag starts solidifying, in ilmenite smelting we get this famous M305 or zero brookite phase and it, it uh, solidifies at a specific rate. Uh, for a chromite smelting slag, it looks significantly different. Uh, the, the, uh, the slopes of the lines are different, the primary phases are different. It's, it's not the same thing in ilmenite smelting and, and in chromite. It's two different types of problems. And we'll see now further why that is the case. Um, this is just a, another form of the same graph where we can see the liquidus and also uh, when we cool down, the solid content, the solid fraction increases from zero, a fully molten bath at about 1600 for ilmenite smelting and then just under 1200 we get a, a fully solidified slag. And that behavior is, is significantly different for, for uh, chromite, which starts to solidify um, as high as 1800 degrees Celsius. Now, the solidus and liquidus temperatures of, of these two slags are quite different. Solidus temperatures roughly around 1200, but uh, liquidus temperatures of 1600 and 1800. So they are uh, substantial differences. Now, if we look at the, the solidus and liquidus temperatures of the ilmenite and the enthalpy, that is absorbed by the slag as you heat it up. There's a unit error here. It's a, it should be kilowatt hours per ton, not, uh, not kilowatt hours per kilogram. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we have these different solidus and liquidus temperatures and the energy required to go from, uh, from uh, the solidus to the liquidus is around about 300 kilowatt hours per ton for the ilmenite smelting slag and 50% more for the chromite uh, smelting slag. So the energy that's involved in this is substantially different. And this energy has to be absorbed or released when forming a freeze line. 
Uh, this is another view on it. Uh, the x-axis is now the enthalpy. So if we extract energy through heat transfer uh, through the, the, uh, the furnace wall, uh, we have a, a fairly linear progression of or, or increase in solid content in, in the case of the, um, the ilmenite smelting slag. But in the case of the chromite smelting slag, this is substantially different. Um, the, the energy to, to solid content relationship. Now, the thermochemical behavior is really important because the, the second law of thermodynamics is really the foundation of how the process behaves. But there are a, a number of other properties that we also really need uh, to be aware of. And if we consider modeling, and if we consider making progress in pyrometallurgy in general, I think one of the biggest bottleneck, if not the biggest bottleneck to our progress uh, in our field is the availability of good quality material property data and uh, uh, material property models. Okay, so if you're a researcher uh, measuring things, uh, please contact us. We would like to, to, to know what you're doing uh, to make more uh, material property data available. Um, now, the properties for slag, alloy, and mat that we, we're talking about are things like thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, viscosity, density. All of these uh, transport properties influence the way that the process internally works. The fluid flow, the, the release of electrical energy, um, uh, all depend on the, 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 the properties of the slag and the alloy and the mat that you uh, that you're working with in your process. Um, the refractor materials uh, on their side as well, we need uh, a good quality data. This is not as critical as the process materials, but thermal conductivity uh, versus temperature density, thermal expansivity, all of these things do uh, make quite a difference if you've got uh, good information. Ex uh, thermal expansivity, for example, we use an experimenter to, to test different uh, furnace startups startup strategies to make sure that, for example, your half lining keys uh, very closely or, or successfully before any molten material becomes available inside um, the process. Okay, now with material properties models alone, we, we can do some of what we said we needed from models. So we can study the influence of material properties and of process conditions on, for example, whether we can sustain a freeze lining and whether we will have tapping difficulties or whether the, the slag will be too viscous. But the it, material property models on their own are not so, uh, so versatile or so powerful to, 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 to give us the functionality to, to answer most of these questions. Now, the next model, that is often uh, encountered when talking about freeze linings in literature. Uh, it's uh, uh, one-dimensional heat transfer models. Now, the approach that we take there is generally it's a steady-state model, so we don't take into account um, transient uh, behavior. Uh, we, we usually assume, well, we always uh, use a constant bath composition, uh, some temperature-dependent properties, uh, of the, the refractory materials, for example. Um, but then we are confronted with, with a number of uncertainties when we want to do these calculations. We don't know what the interface temperature would be between the freeze lining and, and the slag bath. In, in the PhD work that I did, I assumed it's the liquidus temperature. It turns out for some systems, that's a really bad assumption. For others, it's a better assumption. But the fact is, we, it's very difficult to, to know what that interface temperature would be. And it's largely determined by material properties, but also by the conditions in, uh, inside the furnace, whether you have very vigorous stirring or whether it's a quiet slag bath. Um, and the interface heat transfer coefficient, the heat transfer coefficient between the molten slag bath and your slag freeze line, that is obviously in a one-dimensional heat transfer model, one of the, the boundary conditions, and you have to know what that is. And the bottom line is we don't really. 
Uh, in very few cases, we do. Professor David Robertson and one of his students several years ago did some, some experimental work on that and they published a good paper. But that changes so much uh, uh, due to different furnace configurations and material properties. So if this is a, a matter of great uncertainty. And, and, and it is determined by both the process conditions and material properties. Now, this is an example of an output from a, a one-dimensional heat transfer model. Now, on the left, we see the, the, the slag freeze lining. So this is the hot side of the furnace, uh, of the wall. This is the, the brick. This is a ramming layer, and that is a steel shell. Okay. So if we look at this uh, uh, example for different refractory materials, so this example uh, compares three different refractory materials. Um, for a bath temperature of 1700 degrees Celsius, a liquidus temperature of the slag of 1600, and an interface temperature, which is quite a bit lower than the liquidus temperature, because that is largely determined by the effect of viscosity. When, this, when, the, when the mushy zone gets really viscous, at that temperature, you get an interface. And then the solidus temperature of this slag that we evaluated here was 1150. Now, we've got refractory A, which is uh, quite conductive, and uh, refractory B, slightly less conductive, and then refractory C, which is just outright insulating. Uh, this is a... Um, alumina, uh, a bubble alumina material that is really insulating. And let's see how these different materials behave. Now, we've imposed a heat transfer coefficient in this case. Now, this heat transfer coefficient basically tells you the amount of stirring that you have in your slag bath. And if it's vigorous, uh, then you have a high heat transfer coefficient. If it's quiet, then you have a low heat transfer coefficient. Now, for the um, for refractory C, which is insulating, the hot phase of the refractory is above the liquidus temperature of the slag, which immediately tells us that we will not be able to sustain a slag freeze lining in this case. Uh, even the cold phase temperature of, uh, of, the, of, of this uh, thickness of refractory that we've seen here, which is 100 millimeters, it will not be able to, to, to sustain any solid material here. So this wall configuration with refractory C is infeasible if you want, if you need a, a slag freeze lining based operation. Refractory B, which is quite a bit less conductive than the refractory A, can have a hot face temperature for this freeze lining below the interface temperature. And the, the cold phase temperature is below the solid. So we do expect this, this configuration to sustain quite a competent slag freeze lining on the wall. Um, in the case of the, the, the last refractory, um, it uh, is able to, to draw down the, uh, the temperature, the hot phase temperature, even below the solidus temperature, which tells you that this freeze lining will probably be quite a bit thicker than one, uh, 100 millimeters. Okay. Uh, so this is, that was one case study of, of comparing the, the, the three different uh, materials. Now, in this case, we look at it a little bit differently with, a, with the same three materials, but with different process conditions. And the, the, the question that we're asking here is what uh, heat transfer coefficient on this hot phase will allow me to sustain this interface temperature and therefore sustain 100 millimeters of freeze line? which is there. Now, in the case of refractory C, which is very insulated, the heat transfer coefficient is 1.5 watts per Kelvin square meter, which is, it's very, very low. Um, in the case, and, and the problem shown by, the, shown by this uh, green dot is the, the, the cold phase temperature of the freeze lining is not yet below the solidus. So you might find in this case that you, you, the, the, the freeze lining is not so competent um, and it might detach from the wall from time to time, which is not what you want. For uh, refractory uh, B, uh, we have an order of magnitude higher heat transfer coefficient 
that we can allow and still have uh, the, the, the interface temperature that we need and a, a, a cold face temperature below the solid. So this is a, this will result in a competent freeze lining as well. And the same goes for the uh, refractory A, which is even higher, almost double refractory B, which means that if you've got a very high intensity process inside the furnace, then you would probably opt for something like refractory A. Um, you would not want to, uh, to, to use a, a bubble alumina, which is, I think that, that was just for comparison that we chose that. Um, but this can help you to make uh, good decisions regarding your whole configuration. Now, these simple 1D heat transfer models can, can, do, can help us to, to achieve quite a bit more. We can um, consider the influence of slag properties, for example, uh, because we can uh, use the, the solidus and liquidus temperature and the, the transition temperature. Furnace geometry to a limited degree, but we can test lining design and cooling, uh, cooling design and process conditions. Um, to, uh, and the influence of those things on, for example, freeze linings and heat losses. So quite useful, but there's still a number of those items that we cannot uh, address. Now, the next type of model is uh, process models. Now, the approach that we can follow here is what that we've done in the past is, is to build transient models. So they are dynamic in nature and you can simulate the process as it behaves over time. And because it uh, varies over time, we can change the bath composition. We can allow the bath composition to evolve and, and, and find where it wants to be. And we can also use composition and temperature dependent properties. So this is quite a versatile type of model. And what we've done in the, the, the model that I'll show you is there's a full, a complete thermochemical description of the slag inside that, uh, that model. And even of the, the other phases, the alloy bath as well. Now the uncertainties are again, uh, the interface temperature of the, the, the slag freeze lining because this model that I will show you incorporates a, a one dimensional heat transfer model inside of it. Um, and the interface temperature of, or the interface heat transfer coefficient is still uh, an uncertainty. We have not solved that problem yet. We will have to make some assumption or we have to do a sensitivity analysis on that. Uh, and then tapping transient effects. Um, the model as we've configured it, we cannot allow the bath levels to vary. Uh, a more sophisticated model will be able to do that, but bath level variations also influence the, um, the, uh, how the freeze lining responds. And then kinetic effects, specifically transport kinetics. So whatever happens in the bath, the heat flow, the release of energy through dual heating, the, the electromagnetic stirring, we cannot incorporate in models like that. So transport kinetics, you basically impose through assumptions uh, in these types of models. This is what it, it looks like, the, the, the flow sheet of an ilmenite smelting process. Now what happens here is we add ilmenite and reductant, the ilmenite melts uh, through, an, through a reactor and lands in the slag bath, the, redu the reductant lands on top of the bath and then uh, through an interface with the slag, you get reactions that, that drive the process. Now, Importantly, we've incorporated these one-dimensional one heat transfer models into, the, into this uh, model. And the furnace wall is one of the, the models, uh, which is basically the same as the, the, the model that I just uh, presented before, the one-dimensional model. Uh, so we can build an entire uh, furnace uh, wall and then test how that will behave with the process. The crust model is, uh, is useful when you want to allow the bath to crust over um, when you switch off the furnace. We can see how the crust on the, on the bath surface grows, and that also has an influence on the process. Um, and the full thermo the thermochemical description that I spoke of is all of these little reactors are uh, driven through equilibrium calculations with fact age data and chemap equilibrium calculations. So this is a pretty sophisticated description 
dynamic description of, a, of an open bath smelting process. Now, what can we do with a model like this? We can test, for example, is if I, let's say I'm at steady state, and for some reason, I just reduce the power. I change nothing else, I, I simply reduce the power. And what we see here is, uh, this is now the, 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 the wall turned on its side. So we can see the, the slack freeze lining will progressively grow thicker and thicker, which of course, if you uh, add less energy to the system, solidification will occur. And you can also see how the, uh, the thermo, uh, uh, the isotherms in the wall um, goes uh, uh, progressively cooler. Uh, the slag bath temperature in this case steadily decreases, not by much, about 20 degrees. And this probably will be quite difficult to, to detect when, uh, when, you, when you do a measurement. The other interesting thing is that just by uh, removing some energy from the system, we also change the composition of the slag bath due to the solidification and, and the growth of the freeze line. Uh, and, and this gives you an indication that we, we do have a full thermochemical description inside this model, which is quite useful to understand why this process sometimes behaves the way that it does. If we increase the um, the power from a steady state situation where you have a stable freeze lining, you can see that in this case, it was not a, a big power increase. And within 24 hours, you would have lost most of the, the slack freeze line. In this case, the bath temperature didn't really do much. Uh, there's virtually no change in, in bath temperature. Uh, if we change the, the composition of the slag that we are producing, uh, so the, the, the ilmenite composition changes or the, the reductant composition changes, then what we see, we might see that uh, the, the slag freeze lining does not respond uh, to any great degree, but the bath temperature does. And the bath temperature may respond because we are moving towards a different point on the phase diagram. And in this case, we are crossing this eutectic groove that, that runs through this, uh, this phase diagram. So this is quite detailed um, behavior that we can now investigate and, and study. If we have a, 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 a catastrophic type of event where the feed system all of a sudden stops working and we don't realize it, uh, this model tells us that from a steady state situation, it will take about 18 minutes uh, to, to lose uh, a freeze lining of about 80 millimeters. And then after 18 minutes, you will start destroying your, your refractory line. We can see also a, a slight increase in the, in the slag bath temperature, but yeah, this is, uh, if, if you measure with depth thermocouples, will you detect it? Uh, probably, uh, but not with a great deal of uncertainty and, and probably not in time. Uh, if you just you lose the reductant and the, the ilmenite keep, keeps on flowing in the process, then you've got about, double the time to respond, uh, about 35 minutes before you damage your refractory line. And in this case, the, the slag uh, also starts to increase. And because we are not reducing anymore all the, the, the uh, ilmenite that we're feeding, we are moving towards the ilmenite corner of the phase, phase line. Okay, so you, there's quite a few sophisticated things that we can do with a model like that. And we can investigate several design aspects and several operational aspects on a variety of outcomes. Um, so these models can be, can be very useful to make better decisions or to even understand an existing process. Now, if we go to the most uh, sophisticated type of model, multi-physics models, then we can use steady state and transient uh, calculations. We mostly at the moment do steady state calculations. We have to use constant bath compositions, temperature dependent properties, and a simple thermochemistry description. Because if we go any more sophisticated than this, then uh, the models just take so long to, to execute. Uh, the uncertainties are in general material properties, kinetic effects. Now, those are uh, reaction kinetics that I'm referring to. Yeah. 
Now, at the moment, what we can do is we can incorporate to some degree thermochemistry and material properties and conduction heat transfer. That's fairly easy. Uh, thermal radiation in the freeboard, that, that's what we can do with a lot of confidence. Fluid flow, electromagnetic stirring forces, which can have a much greater effect than most people would anticipate. Uh, the arc momentum, one of our colleagues, Tumelo Makwale, did his masters on this, and he, he developed a, a very nice uh, simplified arc model that we can now incorporate into these larger models. And then we can ultimately look at solidification and, uh, and melting of uh, to, to describe freeze line. Now, the, the, the interface heat transfer coefficient, like I mentioned before, is an uncertainty and it's influenced by uh, different momentum sources like the arc jet, which we, we can describe very much better now at the moment. Buoyancy, we can do Lorentz forces, we can do the CO bubbles that, that are in the bath. We have not progressed to that point yet. Uh, the interface temperature also, uh, in the multi-physics models, we can, we can determine that interface temperature. Uh, and it, it will also be influenced by material properties. The melting behavior, we can describe the liquid viscosity, the effective viscosity, uh, but the solid and liquid thermal conductivities, those are the uncertain portions, and you'll have to scavenge literature quite a lot to get good values for those things. But ultimately, if we put all of these things together, we can describe the fluid flow, for example, in an Ilmenite smelting DC furnace. Uh, this is the center of the furnace where the arc is, and this is where the wall is, and you can see a lot of uh, fluid flow in, in the middle, um, and the heat transfer, the, uh, it progressively becomes cooler, this is where the arc is, and the, uh, the furnace becomes cooler towards the wall and towards where the, uh, the, the alloy part is. And on top of all of these things, we can see that we, we form this interlayer that, that we are well aware of that does form in an ilmenite smelting furnace under certain conditions, and we, we can establish a slag freeze line. Now, these models can be, we can use them to study even more aspects and, and answer more questions. Okay, so where does this leave us? Where are we now and where are we going into the future? Now, the current status is that, yeah, we can model and simulate uh, free, slag freeze linings, but we have to use different models for different tasks. We don't have this one magical model that can answer all our questions. If we put all the sophistication in the, in the multi-physics models, at the moment, those models will not come back with an answer for probably years into the future. Um, and the models, are, we are already applying these models for developing new process technologies, uh, for assisting people with, uh, with furnace designs, for failure investigations, and also um, the models provide very valuable information, additional information, when you can combine it with pilot scale work or laboratory uh, tests and, and industrial data. So modeling on its own is not the panacea that will solve all our problems, but it is a, a, it's a significant advantage if we can do it properly. Where are we going into the future? Uh, well, where we do we need to go into the future? And uh, we need to, to build up better databases of material property, properties and also better models. That is, like I said in the beginning, a, a, a substantial bottleneck. Um, experimental data uh, for model validation, that is also a bit of a gap. Uh, so we can describe many of those processes, but to, to really validate them, it is always a challenge because it's difficult to, to generate those data sets. Um, some of the multi-physics solvers are still slow and, and pr problematic, they're not stable. So there's some uh, quite a bit of development that we are busy with uh, in, in our, our multi-physics team are, are, are involved with there. And then uh, Willem Ruiz, one of my colleagues and also a PhD student of mine is working towards integrating thermochemistry uh, into these multi-physics, these big uh, models, which is a little bit of a crazy dream, but we are making progress with that. And then uh, Johan Heinz and his multi-physics team in Experimental, they are, 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 have created a, a framework within which you can look at 
uh, furnace design or, or uh, technology development from a statistical perspective. Um, because of the uncertainty that we are confronted with, we cannot only do one multi-physics simulation. What we currently do in Xmenta is we literally run thousands of them and get to the most probable behavior of a, of a, of a process, which can then be used very robustly to reduce uncertainty and risk. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, this is pretty much my story. If you need some more information, uh, uh, we published an article with Inga Bellemans from Ghent University, uh, which is a review article on, on fundamental aspects of freeze linings. Uh, Willem Roos's first article on, on his acceleration of uh, complex equilibrium calculations was published this week, or it became available online this week. And his second article, which is the big one with the algorithm in it, it will probably uh, become available online within the, next, within the next month or two. So those are all uh, useful and exciting things. Uh, also, if you, if you want to get access to all the resources that Xmedia has published, we are on, on the research guide. You can also have a look at our website. And uh, we're, going, we're hosting our training event, uh, Pyro Week, in, in, the, in, in the beginning of April. And we're also going to, to be uh, present at the SAIMM's uh, PGM conference later this year. We are very excited about that as well. And it would be great to, if we can see some of you there. Uh, just uh, a thank you to my Xmente colleagues for, for all of their contributions. I've bragged a little bit with what they've done um, and for Bushle for chairing the session and for the SAIM and for providing us with this platform. Maybe one last thought. I think I do believe that if we collaborate well together uh, um, in South Africa specifically, we can convert. Uh, the potential that we have in the ground and in our facilities to, to real sustainable value, to the value of all the people in our country. Thank you, Bushle. Uh, many thanks, uh, Johan. Well, very interesting, very, very uh, highly educational uh, session. I don't see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't see any questions under the QA app at this point. I also don't see any questions under the chat. And also, if you have questions, you are also welcome to raise your hand. So you have those three possibilities. Please kindly raise your hand or ask under Q&A tab or under the chat. I am I'm on standby. We have a bit of time. We have just over 10 minutes. Of course, Johan, I do have some questions uh, for you. So the, start, the first one, Johan, uh, under the process models for existing processes, how extensively do you uh, collab or do you work with the uh, industry? Because I see this can be applied very nicely in industry. And it talks uh, to one of the points that you raised that experimental data for model validation is something that is uh, lacking. So it will be a very nice fit when, when you work extensively with, with industry. Could you say a few words on that? Yeah, I think uh, as a commercial company, uh, Xmente, we virtually exclusively work with industry. Um, so we, uh, we have as our clients, we are privileged to say most of the, 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 the smelting companies in South Africa. Uh, and we also do work for, for smelters in the Middle East, in Asia, in North America. Um, and those, those relationships, of, of course, because they are commercial or confidential, and the data from those relationships very rarely uh, um, end up in literature um, because of, of, of commercial constraints. Um, but yeah, I think our capabilities in Xmente, we are benefiting greatly from that because we are learning one project after the other. Uh, but I think uh, we also collaborate with you guys at Mintec, of course, and uh, you have the facilities to to do more fundamental research and, and, and model uh, material properties. Uh, and I think uh, we, as, a, as an ecosystem as a whole, the universities, Mantec and, and companies like Xmentec, we have to work together to, to make this work. Uh, we can bring a little piece to the puzzle, but we can certainly not answer all the questions. Okay, many thanks, Ivan. Uh, I have another question for you uh, regarding, regarding the timing to solve. You mentioned this again in the sofa that there's a gap there. 
that these take quite a long time to solve. So maybe could you please uh, comment then with the different models, the 1D model, which is fairly simple, and the complex uh, process model. And of course, I think I know with the multi-physics models, those are probably quite time consuming. But could you say a few words in terms of how, how long they, they take to, to solve, yeah, to solve problems? That's... Yeah, the, the sort of chemical calculations we do, um, we also, we don't do one or 10 or even 50 calculations. We, in, when we do those, we also run, let's say, 10,000 calculations to, to get a complete map of what the system will do. And if you do, to generate that initial data set, it takes hours to do that. But um, once the, the data is in the database, you can draw graphs at, within seconds uh, to, to interact with the, the data uh, that you've just generated. Um, and and the, the, the calculations are automated with KMAPI. So that is not such a big problem. The process models are also, uh, because they are dynamic and they incorporate uh, uh, equilibrium calculations, they are quite slow and they can run for hours as well. Uh, the 1D heat transfer models can solve in, in a few seconds, even I think in some cases less than a second, uh, depending on, on what software you use. Uh, the multi-physics models, uh, I don't know if Johan Heinz is in the, or Alfred Burghaus uh, are in the audience, but uh, uh, those models, it depends on, on what you're solving. But they can, if, if you've got a very sophisticated 3D model, they can literally run for days on end. But what we try to do as a rule, Bushle, is to, we think first and we calculate later. Because if you don't apply good discretion on, on these things, you can keep a computer very busy, but the results that you get are not very meaningful. So especially with the multi-physics work that we do, we've got a, a very structured framework of, of, of thinking that goes on before we embark on, 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 on heavy calculations. Okay, many thanks, Sayan, for that comprehensive answer. I still don't see any questions under the q and tab, and I don't see any questions under the chat, and also no one has raised their hand as yet. So they're still looking, okay. I think there's, now I've seen one question, uh, so thank you. Is the fixed stage uh, the best one for, to calculate thermochemical reactions from your experience? Um, I'm probably not objective. Uh, uh, it's Eugene Park who's, who's asked that question. Uh, um, I'm probably not objective in, in answering this because a fact stage is the only software package that we use. I know that there are others uh, available as well. Uh, what I can say is that uh, the, the, the fact size databases do help us a lot. We, we do less calculations with fact size and more with KMAPI uh, because we, we automate the calculations. But uh, the, the fact size databases might not be perfect, but in most cases, they are good enough to, for us to, to, to confidently do substantial work for our clients. Uh, but it's, it's material property data that we're talking about. So that's part of the big bottleneck that I, I spoke about. There's a lot of work that we can, can, can do into the future to, to improve matters. And, and one of my PhD students, uh, Blessing Maramba, is extending uh, the data that is available for vanadium containing oxide systems. Because vanadium, the, the, the behavior of vanadium is actually poorly described uh, in, the, in, the, in all the available data in in uh, all the, the, the software packages. Okay, many thanks, Johan. I'll probably go off a tangent a little bit. Uh, so uh, your slide, you had one slide then that showed the need for models and their capabilities. And of course, the focus there was on the techni technicalities, the parameterological technicalities, and of course, fair enough. But I'm also a bit curious on the economics. Can you maybe say a few words then how this uh, supports maybe if, if there's interest on doing a techno-economic study? Um, I have been involved in one master's project where, where we started off doing techno-economic modeling. And we do have a conceptual techno-economic framework available in, in Xmente. That is not something that we often do, but 
should that really become a pressing need, I believe that is something that we that we are able to do. And even if we have to collaborate with somebody that specializes in in, in techno-economics, we can at least uh, uh, contribute the technical part to that. Uh, because I think there are, there are good companies out there who do fantastic work uh, guiding companies with, with good technical economic decisions. Uh, but the models, those, the technical models are often a constraint and, and that's where we can really make a good contribution. Okay, thanks, uh, Johan. There's a question from Julian Maharaj. Are there any process uh, that introduce fluxing for viscosity correction to aid freeze line information? Um, I don't think with that rationale, Julian, I think generally the way to, to manipulate freeze line information or to manage freeze linings what people do is to, to select, uh, if you have the freedom to select a, a, a liquidus temperature roughly, and then to, to, to manage the furnace mass and energy balance. Uh, so you, you will flux to achieve a certain slag composition with a certain melting behavior, and then to, to sustain it, to sustain the freeze lining, you have to make sure that the, the energy that you put in and the energy that flows through the, 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 the freeze lining have to be balanced so that you have that you sustain uh, a freeze lining. But I think uh, maybe in the process design stage, in the concept design stage, you might consider uh, viscosity as a specific uh, a parameter uh, when making decisions to make sure that you are able to tap the slag. That's one. Um, uh, important question, but in to, to confidently think about uh, viscosity and its influence on the freeze lining, I, I think that's not one of the big ticket items that, that we currently look at. Okay, thanks, Johan. There's a question under the QA tab uh, from Sonabo Bamba Laza Is freeze lining suitable for metallothermic reduction? Sonwabo, um, Uh, I think if, if metallic, uh, metallothermic reduction, it's, it's, if it's a batch process, then freeze lining will be very difficult. If it's a continuous process, yes, I think it could be relevant. Uh, and perhaps even in a batch mode, if, if you design your, your, your process unit in such a way that you, that you can process your batch and uh, the, the freeze lining will, will, will not be consumed over that time, then you can contain a batch process also by means of a, uh, of a slag freeze lining, I, I believe. But it, it would depend a little bit about the specifics of the, of the process that you are referring to. Okay, thanks, Jan. Uh, next question from Duzman. Uh, do you have any preferences for respective processes with regards to packages for multi-physics? Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, we use two software packages for the, the multi-physics we do. The one is a commercial package for Flex PDE. This is kind of a, it's a simple, uh, it's not one of the, 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 the very expensive packages, but you have to understand uh, partial differential e equations to do that, but it's quite flexible for, for smallish tasks. If you want to uh, describe larger processes subst of substance, of, of, of 3D processes with a, a lot of physics in them, uh, we uh, you currently use OpenFoam, which is an open source framework. Uh, and this, the solvers for, uh, are mostly developed in-house uh, by, by, uh, by people like uh, Alfred Boerhaars and, and Johan Heinz and, and, and Willem Boers. Many thanks. Uh, I see there's one more comment, I hope, or a question. Oh, so there's a comment from Rodney. Aluminothermic reduction have been performed and reported in the journal of, of JCIMM, at least on small scale, in what are called copper crucibles, and a comment from Lloyd Nelson. Thank you, Lloyd. 
and Rodney <laughs> for, for yeah. bringing it up. So maybe mm -hmm. then uh, we close. It's exactly one minute before 11 o'clock. So I'll just close with the very last comment from Vincent Ross. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Johan Zitzman. The future of computation in the aero industry looks bright and there's much to be excited about. I fully share, I fully, I, I share that sentiment. So it's a big thanks uh, to you, Dr. Zitzman. It's a big thanks uh, to the SAIM. And of course, it's a big thanks to all the participants. I see we have participants from all over the world. I just saw that yeah. Dimitris Paris from Greece, uh, greetings from Greece. So it's uh, Yamas to you guys in Greece as well. So it's a big thanks and it's 11 o'clock and that concludes uh, this session. Thanks. Thank you, Bushley, and thanks everybody for attending. Bye-bye.